So that's that's Ma and Pa Kittlemath. So now as we get in and get talking about this today, there's going to come a point where you're probably going to feel like and think that I'm doing Ma and Pa Kittlemath, but I'm really not. Okay, so I'll show you as we get what into. What was that? What was that quote you said at the beginning? That line. Um, Sphere of influence is not the oh, business. Oh, it's not a people problem. It's a math problem. Working your sphere of influence is not a people problem, it's a math problem. But before we get into that, I first need to make sure that you guys understand um, some other pieces of this first. So, so before we jump into working it, is here's how I see um, the people you're going to work with. So as you are working in real estate, there's really four groups of people that you're going to work with. We're not going to talk about one of them, and I'll show you why in a second, but I'm going to talk about the other three first. And so the SOI is going to be one of those pieces. And so what I want to do is, is first, though, get into and explain and make sure you understand these other pieces. Okay? So we're going to go through and we're going to talk about, the, we're going to talk about three of the different groups. The, the fourth one I'll mention, but we're not going to get into it today, and you'll see why. So the first group is what we would call a client. Okay? Now, there are um, four criteria to making someone be a client. Now, there are different aspects to this when we talk about in terms of a client. Um, and what I mean by that is from the standpoint of the division of real estate, that's not what we're going to talk about. That still applies. I mean, all of those pieces are still there. But that's from a legal standpoint what makes somebody a client. Okay. What I want to talk about though is any, anybody that you help, whether it's to buy or to sell, is going to meet these four criteria and if they don't, they won't do it. So as we talk about that, what are, what are some of the things that you would think that a client has to have, be, do in order for them, or, or a person, excuse me, has to have, be, or do in order for them to be a client? So. There's four protocol. The first one's pretty easy. I'm guessing you guys will get that. By the time we get to number four, I'll probably have to help you, but that's okay. So what what ideas do you have? What what does someone have to have be do in order for them to be a client? Or be qualified. Okay, good. Sean? Okay, good. So the, let's let's first well in fact I'm gonna lump those two together if that's okay. So I'm gonna write it down as need here. But what I would say for you guys to write down is they have to have clear and present needs that can be met. So that's what I would write it down as. Clear and present needs that can be met. So they have to have clear and present needs that can be met. So this is why I would lump it together, Linda, with what you were talking about, is they have to have a need first. So they need, first either have to have a need to sell their house or they have to have a need to go and purchase a new one, which, which we talked about in the last three days about needs analysis and all that. So they have to have a clear and present need that can be met. So when you hear that, a clear and present need that can be met, part of it I would say when, when Linda said they got to be qualified, that would be the clear and present need that can be met, meaning it can be met because they qualify, right? So what else comes to mind as you hear that? Clear and present needs that can be met. They have to have the finances to afford the house that they're looking for. Okay, good. So they either have to have the finances or, or a down payment and yeah. to be able to qualify. Good. Right. Somebody else, I thought, did another hand or no? What was the question? When you hear clear and present needs that can be met, what does that mean to you? A sense of being realistic. Good. Um, I mean, because there's a lot of people that need certain things or that want certain things, but their ability to get them is often a different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or what they they um, think that they want doesn't exist or whatever, right? So yeah, so good. They have to have clear and present needs that can be met. So that can be met, part of can be met means they can qualify. The other part of can be met is like it's real, it's realistic, meaning that somebody that says, I want to buy a, you know, 10 acres in Draper and have a 10,000 square foot home and I only want to spend $200,000 for that. That might be clear present needs, but can it be met? No. Not in Draper, you know, right? So there may be some other small little area in some remote part of the country maybe, but, but not here, right? So clear and present needs that can be met. Okay, good. What else would they have to have?
problem is I set you up to, I took away the most, I made you like look, not looking at the most obvious, and I probably shouldn't have said that. What's the most obvious one that, think in terms of the state of Utah, because it would be part of that. In order for somebody to be a client. Must they have proximity, right? They need to live in Utah. <laughs> okay, I'll give you that. I would say that would be part of the need, though. The clear and present needs that can be met if they're outside and you're not licensed, right? Well, they can have the 10 acres for 200000 They just can't go to Draper. They right. Go out to Tooele or something. Even in Tooele, you're probably not going to get well, 10 yeah, acres and yeah. all that, for right? So what else would you ha Forget any everything I said. If, if prior to what I had said at the start of the class, go back 25 minutes ago, if somebody had said to you, what do you have to have for somebody to be a client, what would have you said? A contract. A contract, right? Agreement. Agreement, right? Okay, so that's another piece of it. Now, I'm going to say it a little differently, though, because it's not just the agreement. In order for someone to be a client, they, so this is what I would say to write down. They have to be committed to working exclusively with you. In order for someone to be a client, they have to be committed to working exclusively with you. Now, how do we demonstrate that they are committed to working exclusively with you? It's through the contract, right? They sign the contract. That's how they do it. So, but is it possible to have somebody who is committed to working exclusively with you and they don't sign a contract? Could so, meaning from the state's yeah. perspective, you still have to have it. I don't want to say that. But could somebody be committed to working exclusively with you and not sign a contract? Yes. To a handshake or something? Yeah, or maybe you just haven't even asked them to do it yet, but they're committed to working exclusively with you, right? It's now, like an implied contract kind of thing, right? Correct, yeah. So what about, though, could somebody sign a contract and have no intention of working exclusively with you? Yes. So really, the paper they sign is just an outward expression of really what is going on. So for the sake of what we're talking about, the, you have, your client first has to be committed to working exclusively with you. They need to have clear and present needs that can be met. Okay, what else would they have to have? This is where it starts to get a little more obscure. I'll probably have to help you. So any ideas? If not, I'll just throw it up there. Throw it. Throw it up there. All right. Number three. They need to be committed I'll to buying. Desire. Okay, good, desire. yeah. Desire they need to be committed to buying or selling now. Now, when I say now, what does that mean to you? Now, remember we just spent three days talking about finding out what it means to somebody, right? So what does, when I say they're committed to buying or selling now, what, when, it, when is now? Seven, ten days. As soon as we find the property. Okay, seven to ten days. Sean says as soon as we see the pro as soon as we find the property or if it's a seller once we get an offer, right? Yeah, for me, when I talk about this and I say they have to be committed to buying or selling now, now means... If it is a buyer and they, we find the property that meets their clear and present needs, they'll write the offer. If it's a seller, if we get an offer in that meets your needs, you'll accept it. Sometimes people will say, oh yeah, we want to buy, but we got to wait till after the kids finish school because we don't want to move until whatever, right? So they need to be committed to buying or selling now as well for them to be a client, okay? And then the fourth one really is more about management of, the, of them, but I still think it is, is one of the criteria that in order for you, now again, from the state, the state would say, well, no, I don't think that's necessarily true, but just from the standpoint of you and how to manage clients and make sure you aren't losing out on deals that you could capture, then I would recommend you do this. So this is more about a management of them. And here's what I would write down. Follow up. Is they have to be, and I think I spelled that right, oh. tethered. Now what does tethered mean? Connected to you. Okay, yeah. Yeah. good. Yeah, you think about as a kid going out and playing tether ball at, the, at school, right? They had the pole with a chain or a rope or something and the ball was on there. You played tether ball, everybody knows what I'm Zip talking about, line, right? I'm tethered. Yeah, good. Connected to. So tethered. How would we tether our clients to us? You mean legally or like in a personal way? That's what, Yeah, not legally. Because legally we would turn and say it's back up to here, this you, the, right. they, by signing agency. Right. But again, just because somebody signed agency doesn't mean they really are tethered to you. They still may go out and like emotionally do something. tethered. Or like... That they feel tethered. Do you 
Communication. Communication. Okay, good. I like that idea. There's, I would take it even a little step further than that. Here's what I would write down in your notes. Follow up often. You have to have an appointment. You can't have a client without having an appointment. You need to have an appointment with all your clients. So what does that mean? If it's a seller, so Sean, you just went out on a listing appointment. You just listed their house. You need to keep them tethered to you. So they have a clear and present need that can't be met. They're, they're realistic on their price. They've committed to working exclusively with you. They demonstrate it by signing agency. They've said, yep, we get an offer at that. We'll close you know, as soon as they can. How do you now keep them tethered to you? What would you do? Okay. Okay, good. So part of that, I would say absolutely for sure. One of the things you need to do with your clients is at a minimum, we should be talking to them at least once a week, right? We should, at, at that seller, we should call them once a week. Here's what I would recommend though. I would recommend with a seller, the way we keep them tethered to us is, is when, as soon as you list the property, schedule an appointment to come back out and sit down with them again face to face in three to four weeks. In that three to after three to four weeks, what would we be doing in that appointment? So I'm scheduling an appointment. I want to come and sit down with you. Now, I, may, I especially in this market, I would probably say to them, this appointment that we're set, that I'm scheduling for three to four weeks out is only to is going to be if we don't get an offer. If we get an offer on your property, I'll probably be, be not probably I'll be back sooner. But in the event we don't, I want to sit down in three weeks with you. Why would we want to do that? Change the price. Good. So so what we want to do is have that appointment scheduled in advance of I'm going to come back out. Now some agents will actually have them sign the price reduction for three weeks in advance. I just personally think it's a good idea to go sit down in front of Even if you have had that, I think it's a good idea to go sit down in front of them and show them here's what's gone on with the, with the marketing and what we've done with, in getting your home sold. Does that make sense? But by having the appointment, you're, you're, uh, you're uh, committing to this, this tether. Uh, That's right. Yeah, because what's the number one complaint? So, so, Sean, do you do many expireds? Do you do many expireds? What, what te tends to be well, the I most... I do a lot of calls to expires. Yeah, but I mean, do you talk to uh -huh. a number? What's the biggest complaint they usually have about their agent? Communication. Yeah, they didn't communicate. They it's listed funny, it. I, I always ask, every time I ask that... Yeah, so what was it you liked about your agent? They're always like, um, yeah, they weren't really good at communicating. I mean, and it's like, what? I asked I did, Yeah, it was what they were no good at, not what they yeah, were bad at. Yeah, yeah. Every no time. yeah, absolutely. So that's where I guess, that's where I'm saying is to avoid that, that's where I'm saying if you constantly had it every three weeks, we're going to sit down and evaluate what's gone on, where we're at, what we're going to do next. And here's it really, here's how I look at it too. Part of what this appointment for me, what I want it to be is, we're gonna, and, and I tell them this, I wanna schedule an appointment for three weeks from today, and then here's what we wanna do, is what I wanna do is that when I come out, we're gonna make a decision, and our decision's gonna be either we leave the price where it's at, we're gonna reduce the price, or we're gonna take the home off the market. And I don't care which one we do, but every three weeks, we gotta make that decision. Are we leaving it where it's at? Are we reducing the price, or are we taking it off the market? And I don't care which one we do, but every three weeks, we need to be making that decision with the seller. So that's part of why, I say, if you schedule that appointment, a lot of times agents will just not go and do it. Now, so if you are getting it signed, a uh, price reduction signed at the time of, great. But most agents are not doing that. They're afraid to do it. And so for me, that's what I'd say, then have this tethered, schedule that three weeks out appointment to go and tell them up front, we're gonna come back and make a decision. Should we take it off the market? Should we reduce the price or leave the price where it's at? And we're gonna do that based on all of the information, the feedback that we get, okay? All right, any questions on the client part? Okay, next. Next one is what we would call a prospect. Now, the definition of a prospect is going to be that they're deficient in one or more of these, okay? So a prospect is somebody who doesn't meet all four of these. So if you, if you have somebody that you're working with that does not have clear and present needs that can be met, they're a prospect. If you have somebody you're working with, they have clear and present needs that can be met, but you don't have agency signed, 
They haven't committed to working exclusively with you. you. You don't have a client, you have a prospect. If you have somebody who is committed to using you, they have clear and present needs that can be met, just not now, they're a prospect or what we'll talk about over here. Or if they have clear and present needs that can be met, they're committed to working exclusively with you, and they are ready to go now, but you don't have an appointment. You have a prospect, not a client. So here's the question. How would we, man if we manage our clients through these appointments, how would I manage a prospect when that might be what I'm missing? So I can't manage them through appointments because that might be this piece that I'm missing. What should we do? Clarify each one of those. When you're working with the prospect, clarify them so that you can make them into a client. Okay, good, but what, but what if I'm missing this one? So what do I do in the meantime? Other than setting the appointment, you mean? Well, let's say that I've had an appointment. Yeah, maybe like I don't have an appointment with them. How would I manage them? Because what I'm saying is through your clients, you manage them by always, every time you leave a client, schedule the next appointment. So with a buyer, don't leave a buyer appointment without scheduling the next appointment. That's how people end up having buyers run off and buy a house from somebody else is because they didn't schedule the next appointment. If you always have the next appointment scheduled for that with that with your client, you won't lose your client. But what if you don't have an appointment scheduled? How are you going to manage them? Because that's what Schedule makes them the appointment. <laughs> okay, so well, how are you going to do that? Call them on the phone. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So the way we manage prospects is we what? contact that was them. That's so simple. <laughs> I know, one time per week. Minimum. So contact, I should have written that up here. One time per week. Well, so like if when you I worked don't, at the dental office. What's that? It's like when I worked at the dental office. When we ha when they have the patients back, they've done the cleaning. So while they're waiting for the doctor to come back in the dental checkup, they were they'd already scheduled the next scheduled the next appointment. Every time. Yeah, which that's where that's smart. Because if 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 my dentist does that, I come back six months later. If he doesn't, I might be nine or ten or whatever before I realize, oh I haven't been for a while, right? Yeah. That's think of it that way. That's exactly right. Now, but if for some reason you don't or you can't get an appointment, what we do is we contact them once a week until we do, until they become a client. Or, so here's another way of thinking of it. Think of it as like up here, if this were a funnel here and these were leads coming in, you, you're getting leads. In essence, your leads are a prospect and then you stay in contact with them at least once a week until they move over here and become a, a client, or if that doesn't happen, because it, let's use the example I said, maybe now is not the time. Maybe they're saying, I, we want to do it and we need to do it, but I'm going to retire next year. So we want the information now, but we're not going to do it for another year. So in that scenario, we wouldn't want to try, we wouldn't want to stay, somebody who's a year out from selling, would we want to call them every single week? No. No, I mean, they would get annoyed with it, right? No, I already told you, it's, I'm not doing this for a year. We wouldn't want to have scheduled appointments with them, you know, every three weeks either, right? Right. So instead, what's going to happen is they're going to move over to this category, or they'll go down to the category four here, which is called... Help. <laughs> <laughs> Close, four-letter word. But yeah, drop. So think of it that way. These leads become a prospect where we're, where prospects are becoming a client or we're going to send them over here to what we're going to call suspects here in a second or we just drop them. So, but we should be staying in touch with those leads, doing that lead follow-up with them every week until they become a client, become a suspect, or we just flat out drop them. Okay? So if they're not going to list for another year but they want you to keep in contact with them. Do you do that every three months, four months? Great question, that's where we're going now. We're gonna talk about, we're gonna spend the rest of our time talking about suspects. suspects. And how do we manage? SOI day. What? I thought this was SOI day. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was gonna get. SOI, how's that? <laughs> that, made, that make you feel better, Sean? You've been working with your SOIs. <laughs> 
It is, this is SOI. That's where I'm going with this. So just stick with me. Because SOI or SOL. But still, this is great. <laughs> yeah. No, that's where we're heading to. But, but, but like I said, I first had to have you understand this piece in order for you to get this so that you understand how to work with people and how to, how to go about it. Because this is where this is. Now we'll get into the, the math stuff. So we're going to spend the next hour and 20 minutes talking about the protocols of these. So think of this as these are the protocols for a client. We're now going to spend the rest of the time talking about the protocols of, of a suspect. A suspect really is going to be somebody in your SOI. So here's how you want to think about that. Let me make sure I'm not skipping anything first. Oh, I did forget something. Okay. All right. So as we go through this and talk about this, as we go through the suspects, so think of it this way. This is probably the best way for, for me to say it to you, is first, what, what defines SOI? Friends and family, you. or someone you're you are. at least conscious of who you are. Okay, good, yeah. So uh, however you decide to de 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 define it for you, whatever, but yeah, typically the SOI is going to be somebody at least that knows who you are. Meaning if I called you up on the phone and I said, hey, Stephanie, this is Russ. And you said, Russ who? And I said, Russ Orchard. And you go, I'm not sure I know who you are. Is that an SOI? No. No. They've got to at least know who you are, right? So contain within your SOI. So on your SOI, typically what will happen, what I'm going to talk to you about is, is really, we're going to go through kind of two pieces of this with the SOI. In terms of your SOI, SOI would be anybody that knows you, okay? So anybody that knows who you are is going to be SOI. On those people, let me show you what you want to do, okay? So we'll throw it over here, the SOI this way. With the SOI, so Sean, how often should we be um, contacting our SOI? Depends. On? Are they A list, B list, C list, D list? Okay, good. That's kind of where I want to go with it. So, but it's just a list. I mean, even that can vary because it can be weekly or monthly. If they're D list, once a quarter. Like okay, perfect. That's where I want to go with it. Is I want to uh, what, think of it this way. So, Sean, even though I'm calling it suspect here, this suspect is going to be your A list. So, when you're asking, I thought we were talking about SOI. That's what we're talking about. We're going to go. I'm going to give you the overall of an SOI. But we're going to spend most of our time talking about this A-list of how do you create a powerful A-list of SOI people, okay? So in, in the SOI, here's what you should be doing. <coughs> Number one is you should contact them or talk to them one time per quarter minimum, okay? You should have that group that, that when I'm saying, now, this is just... A, talking in general, overall, SOI, minimum of one time per quarter. Two, we should be um, mailing to them, so like snail mail, mailing to them one time per quarter. Email them one time per month. Once a month, you should be sending something to them See if I can get this. It's kind of dying out. So contact once a month, once per quarter at minimum. Mail something to them once a quarter. Number three would be then email them something once per <coughs> month. Why would we do that once a month? Awesome. Refresh. Good. And it's it's free versus you do a mailing, you're spending a whole bunch of money on it, right? Yeah. And then number four to that would be you should be doing some type of what I like to call a hub event. Now, a hub event would be some type of an event that you do for your clients. Now, good news is, as a company, we help generate and provide a few of those for you. So for example, we've got this Easter egg hunt coming up in April. This would be a great thing that you should be doing with them. So hub event, I, I would say one to two times per year. Do some type of a hub event. Now, so the hub event, this Easter egg hunt, great thing that you can do. I think what, what ends up, I'm not sure on this one, how if you had end up having to, to spend money, but in uh, October, we do the pumpkin patch. 
typically you spend a hundred bucks, you get to invite X number of people from your SOI. So do some type of a hub event with these guys one or two times a year. Another one that a lot of agents will do is go rent out a movie theater. So when there's the premiere of a, of a movie coming out, go rent out a movie theater and invite your SOI to come and watch the movie. The beautiful thing with that is you get the first you know, 10 minutes or so before the movie starts that you can stand down there, do a little commercial for them, or even just tell them how much you appreciate them all, whatever, letting them know that you're here to help with their, with their uh, real estate needs. Um, but that's what, that's what you should be doing on a hub event with your SOI. And then number five to it, that I, piece that I would say would be some social media. And on social media, on that piece of it, here's what I would speak to in terms of the social media. On social media, um, think of Facebook as a barbecue, okay? If you were going to a barbecue, would you go dress like I'm dressed right now to a friend's house for a barbecue? No. Why? Well, you're a little too dressy. You need to be in sandals and... Yeah, be more casual, sure? right? Yeah. <laughs> now, what would happen to if I showed up to a barbecue dressed like this and I was constantly walking around going, hey, Stephanie, who do you know that's thinking about buying or selling real estate? You know, the market's really good right now. I mean, you, you should be buying an investment property. When, when can we talk about you buying an investment property? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd probably invite you a little less to these parties. Do you think? So? I mean, <laughs> is that true? I mean, if, I, if every time I came over and saw you, I'm asking, Linda, so when do you want to buy a house? What are you thinking about selling your house? I want to help you sell your house. But you know, that's not a real bad thing. It just depends on how you approach somebody. You know, through a conversation, yeah, I sell homes. You know, okay, you, yes. Hey, so get that's a hold the, of me or throw them a card. Well, so that's the Let's key. Let's talk after the barbecue sometime. You, uh, any social media stuff that you do, think of it like a barbecue. It, what if, though, Stephanie, we had, you had invited me to a barbecue, and I came over, let's say we did it four times in the year, and one time out of the four, I asked you, so have you ever thought about buying real estate or, or selling or doing anything real estate-wise? Because I just helped a client get this investment property, and God, I mean, it's going to be a great retirement vehicle for him. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, would it be a big deal if I did that one time out of the four times we had a barbecue? I don't think so. No. But I mean, everybody's going to have a conversation of doing probably their own work. Hey, I work on everybody's teeth. You should have seen this guy's gross teeth. And then they start the conversation about that. Well, that's his business. Right. So your business is, hey. Ed, so, but that's the key is anything you, you do social media, just make sure that it's not only real estate, only real estate, only real estate. The only caveat to that would be if you had a real estate page, obviously, that would be fine. But just on your personal one, don't, it's, do, do put stuff about real estate, that's a great thing to do, meaning you're out um, showing a house or you see a house, whatever, and you see one that's like something weird and old Oops. or cool, something like, take a picture and put it on to social media and just say, was out showing houses today and saw this cool thing, blah, whatever it is. I mean, you're not like in their face about real estate, but you're reminding them that you do real estate by doing that. So you have a funny experience, a funny phone call. Go post something about that. That's fine. What you just want to be careful is is the constantly asking, asking, asking. Or if me, you do me, that me. on social media, that's right. So the conversation is all you and your real yeah. estate stuff. All right. So any questions on this piece? No. Okay. Good. So now let's jump into. <clears throat> so really, this is where what I'm what we're going to talk about now is. So this, however many people you have in this group, I don't really care. Meaning. There are some agents that will be in the business forever and have 7,000 people. You were at production retreat, right? I mean, that somebody got up and said they had 7,000 people in their database. Now, what I'm going to talk about for this, you could not do it with 7,000 people. It's not going to work. But if you'll do it with a small number, it will work. And I'll, sh I'll show and explain what you mean. But this, you could do. Actually, I'm even iffy on if you could really, I don't think you could even with 7,000 people, contact them all once per quarter meeting talk to you know call leave a message or whatever but but so this is kind of your SOI what we're going to talk about now though what I want to spend time talking about this suspects is going to be a group that will contain and you can think of it either way either as part of your SOI or you can think of it as it's a totally separate group from your SOI either way I'm fine I actually like to even think of it as just in some respects for some people 
if they do this right, this will become their SOI, which is why I say call this a work in the SOI class. Because if you'll do this, essentially it can become a very powerful SOI. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. But, but I need to lay some more groundwork with you first. Now, if I were to just take a map, and I drew a, a horrible circle on the map like this, what are the odds that, that contained, if I just pull out a map, and this would have to be a pretty big area, but if I just drew a circle on a map and said, okay, in this area, what are the odds that the people in this area are going to be moving or buying or selling, doing something real estate related? Highly, most likely. What's that? It's likely you're going to find. Yeah, but, but how, activity. sorry, I, I didn't ask that right. What would be the percentage of people? That's how I should have said it. What's the percentage of people within this circle? And again, granted, it'd have to be a pretty decent sized circle. I mean, I, you couldn't take four houses and, or even 10 and do this. But if you took a large circle, what is the number of people across the country that are in the process of either buying or selling at any given moment? Should Does that make right. sense? How about a like quarter? 60%? Maybe 10%. 30%? I'd say a quarter. Really? You're, You're talking about people that are shifting around. Do you think it's 60? Yeah. That are people are moving? Buying or selling. At any given moment. Uh -huh. okay. So what is it? So according to the um, last census, when I looked up the last census, the number, the percentage of people that every year are moving, what they said was that it was 12%. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that was too far off. That wasn't too bad. Yeah, so 12% of the people are in the process of buying or selling at any given moment in time. So let me tell you what that oh, means. Oh, you know what, that's right. Because one out of every 10 people you talk to will be in that. Thank you. Now, so that's, right. that's where I want to go. So typically, uh, Linda just said one out of 10 people are going to be doing something, right? How many of you have heard that? What I'm going to show you is where that came from, okay? So here's where that came from. Essentially, that w where that comes from is something like this. If you were to take 1,000 people and say, of that thousand people, how many of them are going to be doing something uh, real estate related? The, the number would then end up being 120, right? Mm -hmm. So from that, now here's where I'm going to start getting into some ma and pa kettle math with you, potentially <laughs> for a minute, okay? But the, the, this is as complex as it's going to get. But <coughs> typically where, what people will say, let me do this off to the side here. Typically people will say, for every 100 people, you should be able to get 10 leads, and from those 10 leads, do one deal. That's kind of the numbers that t people typically will say in terms of real estate. This is where that comes from, is out of 1,000 people, or I guess we could even just do 100, out of 100 people, 12 people will end up doing, or, or would be potential leads that would then turn into probably one deal. Now. If let's say that those 12 people, though, are do end up buying and selling, how many transactions does that turn into? This is where it's going to turn into some... Wait, say that again? Okay, so if I had, let's use this, if I got 100 people, uh -huh. there's 12 of them that are going to do something real estate related. How many potential transactions does that end up being? Well, no, not not just for you, but in general. Oh, in general. Yeah, not for you, because that's where typically that's where people will say the numbers are: out of a hundred, ten people are going to do something. You'll get ten leads, but you'll only end up working with one of them. What I'm saying though is, out of these twelve, if all twelve of them do something, how many transactions does it become? Say it, Sean. You, he's he's giving me sign language back there. Yeah, it's twenty-four. 24 oh, transactions. Right. Why? Buy and sell. Okay, good. Yeah, this is where sometimes people think I'm doing mom and pa kettle math, but, but because for every home that sells would equate to two transactions because there's a buyer side and a seller side, right? So that would be 24 transactions that would come out of that, okay? Now, what if though Linda brought up and said that it, uh, initially, maybe I shouldn't have said that reminded you guys who, but said 60%, right? What if, though, there was a way to work a group of people where instead of 12%, 
we actually were at we actually were at 60 percent, which actually happens to be actually a, a, the accurate number of this. What if there was a way to work a group of people that that you could actually expect a 60 percent return on that? If you had to choose to work here or here, which would you choose? 60. So, Linda, what about the rest of you? I mean, it may, and you're not answering because it was like a stupid question, I guess, right? You're making me scared of the catch. I know, you're, I know you're afraid I'm going to trap you, right? No, yeah, what I'm telling you is if you will do and follow these four protocols that I'm going to give you for this, you can have something where you can expect a 60% return versus down here at a 12% return in your uh, return on time invested, okay? Because really that's kind of what we're talking about is a return on time invested. When you are prospecting, that's really what you are looking at, right? Is what is the return that I'm getting for the time I invest into this particular activity? Well, obviously, if I came to you and said, I got two properties. One property you can purchase and you can rent it out and you're going to get a return on your money of 12% or the other one you're going to get 60. Clearly, you're going to say, I want to buy the property up here, right? Now, here's the thing. In real estate, one of the things that I have observed over my 20 years, 21 years, I guess, this month, and Daryl, you're, I always remember, 30 or whatever years, right? Not in your character. <laughs> yeah, you are. But it, it is, agents are always looking for the magic bullet or the silver bullet, the magic bean. The, yes. the, the magic pill. What is the magic? Here's what I'm going to tell you. There is no magic pill. There is no magic <laughs> bean. It's called work, right? But, what, but, but here's what I'm going to say. Why I bring that up is this is the closest thing you're ever going to get to the magic bullet or the silver, the silver bullet or the magic as bean. Gets. This is as good as, as a thing as you're ever going to get Let's out of this business. It. Now, here's why. The reason for that is because the, the management of this is a math problem. Remember, we started this by saying it's a math problem, not a people problem. Now, before I get into that, though, the math of this, I first want to show you something. We're going to talk about two types of systems. We're going to talk about an open system, and we're going to talk about a closed system. Does anybody know the difference between an open system and a closed system? Mm. One's fluid. Say what you mean by fluid. Come, changes from time to time according to the <coughs> parameters <coughs> or just whatever transpires. You okay. can come and go from your list. Okay, Russ? Would an open system kind of need inputs to work and then outputs or like a closed system is almost like a perpetual machine where it doesn't really need anything else, it just keeps going? Pretty close. Actually, even with a closed, well, I'll, let me show you. I'm gonna, I'll, uh, we're going to do a visual demonstration here uh, to show you the difference between an open system and a closed system, okay? What are the odds, so somebody pick a number between one and six. I used to not say that. I'd say pick a number and somebody would say nine, right. you know. So, okay, so Linda said four, okay? What are the odds that when I roll this dice that I'm going to get a four? One out of six. So one out of, it's a one in six one is six. the ratio, right? So one out of every six times I roll this, I should get a four, right? Correct? Yes. Okay, let's see. Should. Let's see what happens. So there's a five. In fact, let's do this. Let's keep track here. So I rolled it once and got a five. Twice, I got a four. All right. So I rolled it two times and I got one four. So what are my odds? Two to one. Okay. Now let's do it again. Okay. I got a two. So there's one tick mark. There's another two. Three, six, a three, thank you. Okay, so I've rolled it five times. What should happen this time? Four. I'm going to get a four, right? Yes. Because the odds are one out of every six times I'm going to get a four. Money, money, money. Oh, so I got a three. Gun. 
What happened? You blew it. Well, let's try it again. Maybe, you know, maybe. Well, let's just. You already got one. Let's try it again. This, this is what happens with poor gamblers. Oh, three. What the heck is going on, guys? But the odds are one in six. How come I'm not getting a four? You've got to do it a hundred times. Okay, there's a one. So you got three more. So I actually, they'll get rid of these two. So it, it, what, you, what you're saying, Sean, is within. On the third one from now, I'll get a six, I'll get a four. It should, but it could also be. Yay! Oh, I got another six. I got a four. Two in that last I got a four. So, this time I rolled it how many times? Nine. Nine times to get. Four. One four. So what's going to happen if I, if I were to keep doing it? I'm not going to. But if I were to keep doing that, what would happen? You would get a four coming up. Level out. Yeah. So well. So here's the two pieces from this. Yes. There is a theory in math called the regression towards the mean. Now, you don't need that for your notes. That's not important. But, but there's a theory of that that basically says, if I roll this enough times, now, I don't know what that is. Maybe it's probably got to be 100,000 or 200,000 or whatever. But if I roll it enough times, maybe even 10,000 times, what's going to happen is it's going to balance out to be a 1 out of 6. But is it possible that I could get up here and roll it 20 times and never get a... Four? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You could roll it a hundred times and not get a four. I could roll it a hundred times and not get a four. So here's the thing. So here's the problem with how most of us approach and think about these numbers. So let me show you. Go, let's, we'll go back to this that Linda brought up. So if you, if you looked at this and said basically it's a one out of ten, so this, is kind of, this one is a one out of ten and this one's a one out of ten. So if the odds are one out of ten, what that says is if I go talk to Stephanie and then Linda, and then James, and so I keep going and I keep talking to all these people and I get to where I've talked to nine people, what should happen on the next person I talk to? Well, you think your odds a win. We I should a get win. a deal, right? Because that's what the odds say. Right. Here's the problem with that. We don't think about odds the way that they really work, meaning, which is what Russ was bringing up. So if the odds were one out of, nine to one, let's so it was one out of ten, but let's so the odds really are nine. There's nine that are not to one that is, right? So that the odds are nine to one against me. So if in this scenario the odds are nine to one against me, and I go talk to Stephanie, the odds are nine to one against me, right? That she's going to say yes. What are they when I get to Linda? Nine to one. They're still nine to one. I get to James. Nine to one. Daryl. Nine to one. Russ, nine to one. It, see, it doesn't matter if I've, what Russ said. It, even if I've talked to a hundred people and I still haven't gotten it, what are the odds? Nine to one. Yeah, why? You're right, why? Well, it doesn't reset. Because that the odds don't change. It's an open system or a closed That's system? an open system. That's the way an open system works. The way that Las Vegas works is they know what the odds are, and the odds are on some things just one percent in their favor but because of that do they care if you go down there and hit the jackpot no they love it if you do why because then you're going to spend it all again it, well you're probably going to spend it but what does it do to the other people who oh, see they they're going to they, now it. they're excited see all they care about all las vegas cares is that people are in the casino putting money in there if they don't care if you hit the jackpot and win. In fact, it's a good thing because it has more people want to go dump money in there. And they just know they have the odds set up in their favor. So really, volume is the only thing that you can control when you're talking about... In an open system. About, I mean, if your odds are always going to be 9 to 1, then literally the only thing you can ever do to increase your odds is to increase your volume. Correct. That's an open system. Now... Do we like open systems? <laughs> I'll let you tell me in a minute. Now let me tell you about a closed system, okay? Now, so we're going to play this same game, only I'm going to change the rules to the game. Now, you can't do this in Vegas. I wish. I wouldn't be here if you could. I'd be there doing what we're talking about. But you can't do it. So we're going to go. That's an open system. What we've just been talking about is an open system. Now let's talk about a closed system. In a closed system, how it works is... What's going to happen is we're going to do the same four. We're still trying to get the four, okay? In this closed system, though, what's going to happen is because this is my business, it's my game, I get to decide the rules of the game. And this is the same goes for you guys. You get to decide the rules for your business. 
for your real estate career. You get to decide the rules. Now, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to roll it again, and I'm going to keep track again of how many times I have to roll it to get a four. But here's the only change. In a closed system, how I get to do it is to say, every time I roll a number that's not a four, I'm going to put one of these stickers on that number. Now, the next time that number comes up or you see a sticker land on the top, I'm not going to count it because that's what makes it a closed system. Okay? Is that you following me? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm still trying to get a four. And let's see what happens now. Okay, there's a five. So I'm going to take a sticker. I'm going to put this sticker on the number five. If I roll a five again, we're not going to count it. Okay? So we're doing the same thing. We'll keep tick marks here to see. So if this sticker comes up, we don't count it as a roll. We get a free throw. That's the rules of the game. I get a free throw. Okay, there's a one. So I put a sticker on it. We'll count that one. And let's roll it again. Six. So now, I'm going to take that, put a sticker on, we'll count it. So it was a one. So free throw. So I'm not counting. Three. I hate it when it does this, but we'll do it. You know, it is what it is. It still doesn't line on. I haven't landed on a four. <laughs> but that's okay. Okay, free throw. That was a three with the sticker. Free throw. Sticker. I get a free throw. Sticker. Free throw. Sticker, free throw. Sticker, free throw. All right, you roll. Let's see yeah, if it gets any better. Hold it. See if Linda's got the hot hand. Nope. <laughs> Man, how many times have I rolled this? All right. Well, look, it's a two. Okay, so now we got the two. Okay, so what's going to happen now? I mean. This is why I say I hate it when it happens, because I like it better when it or at least comes up once in the process. But what's going to happen now? I've got a sticker on every single number except for the four. Yeah. So what's going to happen? Oh, you're going to get a four. I'm going to get a four. <laughs> but, and so what's going to end up happening is, for the sake of time, I won't keep rolling. But I'm going to keep rolling until I get that four. So now what were my odds? Five to one. Five to one. Now, what happens though the next time, the ne this next round now, I'm not taking off the stickers. Now I'm going to roll it again. What's going to happen? You're going to get it. Eventually, you're going to get a four. Every time. It's going to be one to one every time now, right? Yep. So let me ask you, which way would you rather do business? With an open system where you might no. do nine to, one, to one, one, or you want the closed system where it's one to one? Okay, now here's the good news. Who's in charge of your business? Me. So you get to decide the rules because it's your business. What I'm going to show you is how to approach this group of people as a closed system. So that's the first protocol. Remember I said I was going to give you um, four protocols? So the first piece of this is it has to be a closed system. Now, what makes it a closed system is this. So, so this is kind of, this is still part of this closed system. But let's put in parentheses here. Whoops. So it has to be fixed in size. So this is what makes it a closed system, is what we want is this group of people is going to be fixed in size. Fixed in size means you determine what the number is, and then that's the number. Meaning, and here's what I'll tell you, for, for you guys, actually for anybody, getting this started up, working this way, working the system this way, the number you want to have it be is 200. 200 people. Okay? Wait, you want 200 SOI? So, now this yeah. is what, yeah, so it, it, you could do it one of two ways. It, so yeah, let me, I'll explain. It could be one of two ways. Let's, if you had a thousand people in an SOI, what I want you to do is pick who you think the 200 best are for this. So now we're sifting if, through them. 
to see who's the good ones and who's the correct the dropped ones. It's correct. Found out about the fluid. So we'll yeah. So, or so or let's say well go ahead go with your question. Okay, I guess my thing is <coughs> SOI or if you're doing like prospecting, uh, who falls in that two hundred? Great question. Hold that thought for one minute, okay? Okay. Well, actually, should we do it? Yeah, let's just do it. Okay. Perfect question. So here, remember we talked about here of as you're prospecting, you're generating leads. <coughs> you're going to stay in contact with people once a week until they um, either become a client, you drop them, or I would say you end up then putting them into this SOI list or this suspect list. Because like right now, all I my only system is either like I don't have this drawn out system. All I have is is if you buy now, great. If not, I I drop them. Yeah, so see, I, and that's, my three by five cards, I just keep going, right? Yeah, see what so what you're doing is this. Let me show you. You're prospecting like this for now business, uh -huh. which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good. You should do that. But what I'm saying is why not at the same time as you're doing that, mm -hmm. you're spending time to go and generate a lead that if they're not ready in the next seven to 10 days, what if you just said, well, that's fine. I need to work my database mm -hmm. or SOI. What if I just said to that person, hey, maybe you don't say this to them, but in your, your own mind, you're saying, they're not ready right now, but they will be. So what I'm going to do is take them and throw them into my database of to people that I'm going to stay in touch with. So what we do is instead of prospecting on one track, now I'm prospecting on parallel tracks. I'm looking for now business and the future. The people who say I'm not ready right now, great. I'm going to put you in my database and I'll stay in touch with you. And over time, they will mature and become ready. But it, if they don't, that's okay too. But you need to be working in SOI database anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Why not add these people to your SOI right. instead of just throwing them away? That's true. Now, and you'll, you, as I get more into it, it'll make even more sense to you, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so here's the thing. If I'm doing this, and, and then we're gonna, I'm going to get into some more math here with you in a second. But if I'm doing this, so if it's fixed in size of 200. Now, what if you don't have 200? then build it up to that. So as you generate leads, put so them we, into... We need to get to a close system of at least 200. To begin with. Now what, I'll, what I'm going to tell you in a minute is you can change that number to any number. Ultimately what matters is that it's a closed system because you saw how powerful a closed system can be, right? Mm -hmm. I mean I, I changed the odds from this to this right. by changing the system to be from open to closed. If I change this database to being from open to closed, I'm doing the same thing, and you'll see the power in it in just a second here. So ultimately, it doesn't matter what number it is. It just needs to be fixed in size. But what I have found is for new agents, it, it really actually, let me take that back. Not even new agents. Any agent who has not done this, you need to get it to 200. Now, some people may have, say, I've got a database of 1,000 people. Great. Pick the 200 best to start with. Here's why. What it's going to do is something like this. The, for, you, for this to pay off for you, it's going to look something like this. This is the learning curve. But here's what happens with this. Is you're going to start contacting and calling these people. Who are we talking about? Our suspects? No, but it's, yes, oh. yes, sorry, yeah. It's going to take between six and nine months for this group to really pay off. And what I mean by that is, is where you can rely on it. Because here's what I'm telling you. Okay, so stick with me for a second on this as I go through it. And then I'm going to show you the math of how this works. But what will happen is if you will do these four protocols I'm going to show you, what will happen is you'll be able to ramp it up like this. And what I'm telling you is from the point that this matures, and, and I would define maturing as being 60% here, the point that that matures, from that point on, which should mature about, this, you know, like I say, that if this were a timeline, it's going to be about six to nine months, depending on who the people are that are in there. It'll take six to nine months, but it should, it'll mature. From the point that it does that, you can count on a six-digit income from that point forward, just out of this group. Now, that's not saying you don't continue to work other groups, but from this group, you can count on a six-digit income, and I'll show you the math to that. Go ahead. I'll just hang tight. Okay. 
So everybody following me here? Yes. Okay, so how we do that is by a closed system. And the reason I say you need 200 people to begin with to start, why you need to do it that way, is because this is what it looks like. So if it's going to take six to nine months before you can then count on it to generate this income for you, look at what's happening here in the first, you know, one, two, three, four, five. I mean, I, I, this is not to scale, obviously, but what's happening in the first few months of doing this? Nothing. Sort of sitting still. Pretty much nothing. Now, here's the problem. Here's what I will tell you. Of everything that I have learned, that, that I've trained on, the thing that right now, at this very moment, standing right here, still, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. This is the one thing in real estate that I'll tell you still today gives me goosebumps because it is a math problem. It is guaranteed to work if you'll just work the math. And, and seriously, I have goosebumps right now thinking about it because it's so, it is the only thing I can <coughs> promise you in real estate, if you will do it, it will work because it's a math problem. It's not a people problem, it's a math problem. But the, but, but the reason people don't do it, that, I mean, the, and so here's my frustration. It works. There is no question in my mind that it works, that it will work. I've, I've proven it over and over again with different agents that, that have done it. But most people don't do it. And why do they not do it? Because of what I'm because showing you. Because it's hard. That first six months. That first little while, you, get beat up. you feel like I'm working really hard and I'm getting nothing. And, and, and I would even say you're not even getting beat up. It just feels like I'm doing all this effort and putting all of this into it, but I'm getting nothing from it. But, but here's what I'll tell you. Somewhere between month six and nine, again, depending on, on who you put in, and I'll explain that in a second. It ramps up. I mean, it, all of a sudden, it will go from, it, probably the best analogy I could use of it is the Chinese bamboo tree. You guys have heard the story of the Chinese bamboo tree, right? What happens when you plant the seed the first year? What happens the second year? Third year? Fourth year? Fifth year? No, what happens in the fifth year? Blooms. And what does it do? In a matter of six weeks, it grows 90 feet. But what happened to the first four, yeah, four to five years? It was waiting and scratching its head like we do. It was putting a system in place underground that you couldn't see so that it could then shoot up in year five. That is what's going on with this. Is Because agents can't see underground to see what's going on with the root system of this, they give up on it. And if well, you'll think of it... Huh? Or if they have failures, too many failures. Yeah, well, and, and, they, and they, they, per hands up. Yeah, they perceive the failure, though, as if it was a failure because I haven't gotten it. I don't see the plant, the Chinese bamboo, growing. It's not growing. So I, why do I keep watering it and pulling weeds and doing all that stuff? Nothing's happening. But that's, this is what happens, okay? Now, so the, that's the reason, part of why I say you need 200 is because... During this time, that 200 is going to turn over pretty quickly. Okay, so let me explain that. Go ahead. And with that 200, you say we're doing this guy right here. This? In order no. to get that. No, you haven't talked about. I haven't the, talked the about these. We're going to do to That's right. It's it is similar okay. to this, though. I'll tell you. Okay. Okay. So on this now here, but but here's where the magic of it get comes in is because it's a closed system. So once once it does this. Once it ramps up and takes off for you, you can change this number to any number you want it to be. Some agents change it to 300 once that happens. That's fine. Most, though, what I found will drop it to anywhere between 75 and 150. Typically, though, more 125. Somewhere around 100 is kind of if I had to average it out, I guess, what I would say. Somewhere, they'll typically drop it to 100, and I'll show you why in a second on that, too. But they'll typically drop this to 100. But the reason you need 200 is it'll get it. That's what's going to get it happening in six months versus nine or a year. If you just said, I'm going to go to 100 and do that, it's going to take longer than if you say 200. Okay. So next piece of this. So what happens then? Let's say that I've got these 200 people. I'm staying in touch with them. And along the way, one of them calls me and says, um, hey, I know we would talk to you and said we were going to buy a house in a few months, but we actually just got a job transfer, so we're now moving to Florida. 
um, and we're not going to be able to buy there because the housing is too expensive. So we've been renting here. We're just going to rent there. Okay. I just lost one of these, right? Mm -hmm. No. Well, how did I not? You say, great. We'll just get connect you up with someone down in Florida and you're good to go. But they're going to rent? Well, they'll be in somebody else's SOI. So I <laughs> that, I'm good with that. But how many people do I now have? They're 199. Now it's a closed system. Means it has to stay fixed in size. So what do I have to do? Delete them. Well, yeah, so they're deleted, well, but now so I'm at 190. To add I got to add somebody else, right? So I have to go and add somebody. Now, let me show you what this looks like. We're going to do, I'm going to show you this. We're going to do the math here. So let me really erase this. Actually, I'll just get rid of all this. Okay, so we're going to say, now for the ease of numbers and showing you the math on this, I'm not going to use 200, I'm going to do it at 100 just because of the ease of numbers, okay? So let's say that I had over here, that I've got here um, 100 people. Now, let's say we're going to classify these people as either black or red, okay? So. I wish I had a green marker. That will do orange. I like using green because that like is the color the money. of money, and so. But I don't have a green marker, so we'll do. Pretend this is green. I was gonna say I have a I'll green be, marker. Do, you do have one? Oh, that's all right. We'll just mm -hmm. use this. This will work. Okay, so I'm gonna do. We'll call that green, even though it's orange, and this was red. Okay. Let's say, of the hundred people that I have in there that 50 of them are green, or in this, I mean, we're pretending I'm colorblind for a minute, okay? We have 50 of them that are green, meaning we're gonna make money off of those people. And we have 50 that are red. Now, why would I have 50 that are red? Red are gonna be people that are not gonna do business with me, they're not gonna refer business to me. Why would I have red in there? You don't know, do you know who is Thank green you. and who is red? You just landed on it. I don't know who's red. I don't really oh, okay. know who's green and red. So how do you know whether to put them in the red column? Well, well so I'm not, really not, not doing that. I'm green. just keeping this fixed in size. But just to show you guys the power of this, let's just say that we somehow magically knew 50 were green and 50 were red. We don't know, though. Over time, we will know. So that's the answer, Stephanie, is over time I'm going to figure it out. But to begin with, I don't know. Shift them around. Now, let's say though, now remember, it's got to be fixed in size, right? Right. So I go out now and I am prospecting, and I don't, it doesn't even matter what I'm prospecting. Could be for sale by owners, could be expired, could be just listed, just sold, could be calling my database, whatever it is. I meet somebody that says, I'm not ready right now, but I'm going to be down the road or we may down the road. We just thought about it. We're not, no, we're not serious, but we're thinking about it, okay? So I take that person, let's say actually that I had a really good day prospecting, and I get 10 leads, okay? And let's say I decide, all 10 of them have told me they're not gonna be doing anything right away, but maybe down the future they're going to, okay? So I say, okay, I've got 10 leads now. Now would I add a lead if I know they're red, if they cussed me out, told me, you know, gave me the bird as I'm knocking on their door, am I going to add that person to somebody to no. a database ever? No. So I'm never going to add one, uh, somebody that is red. I'm going to add what I think is green, or in this case, orange, right? I'm adding people that I think are going to generate income for me either themselves or by referring somebody to me, right? Right. So now, let me show you. Now, here's the problem, though. Here's what most people do. Most people will add those to their database. So now they've got 60 that are green, 50 that are red, which gives them a total of what? 110, right? Now, if we just looked at percentages though here, out of the 100, what are the percentages? This is, now you'll see why I'm using 100. Look how easy it is to do the percentages, okay? Now, 
But if I just did this and I added now, I've got 110 people in my database, 50 are red, 60 are green, or in this case orange. What is What percentage is this of 110? Somebody do the math real quick on your calculator. Divide the 60 into 110. It's what? Yeah, James. 54%? So now look what just happened. Almost 55. 55.5. 54.5. I mean, it's 0.545. Oh, you know what? I messed up. Round it up, it's 55. I messed up. I messed up. Sorry. We got to no. fix this. I know, sorry. I know. Okay. Here, no, son. I, re I just realized, okay. So I, I said that wrong. We think that we're only adding people that are going to do something. But what is the reality if you got 10 leads? That Half of them are really going to. Yeah, how many are really going to do something 12, versus? 12. Yeah, and I don't care what number. You guys make it up. So you want to do half? Yeah. Okay, so let's say half. So, so in essence, what's happened, this is where I screwed up, is we added five here and we added five here. Now, the truth is we thought we added 10 to this side, but in reality, half of them are probably not gonna do anything. Does that make right. sense? Yep. So now, really, instead, so redo the math for me, James, if you would. So now it's do 55 into 110. 50%. Yeah. I'm messing up sure. all my, yeah. Yeah. is it still 50%? Yeah, okay. it is. Duh. Okay, that works. So, but here's the key that I want you guys to understand. So notice the percentage didn't change, but what changed? More numbers. The amount of work that it requires you to do to get 50% went up, but you're still only getting 50%. Mm. Following me? Yeah. Now, so let me give you the second protocol over here on this. Number two. On this one, we're going to still mail to them, or excuse me, or email, and I don't care which one, but mail or email monthly. Okay? So we need to still send a mailing or do an email, and it can be either or, doesn't matter, but mail or email. So you could do email two months and mail one month like we already are talking about anyway, however you want to do it but you need to be sending them something monthly. So if, if I now have 110 people that I've got to do a mailing to, what, what just went up? The, the, the cost that I'm spending went up and my time goes up because the other thing that I have to do that's part of this monthly is I need to have personal contact one time per month. That's still number two. Yeah, that's still part of number personal two. Personal contact, you mean the phone? Either a phone or a text or an in-person, doesn't matter. But, but not I need an to, email or a monthly. In addition to the in addition email. To. Yeah, so it's both. Got it. I need to have contact with them one time a month. Personal, Popeyes. personal, what? Can I say Popeyes. Yeah, personal contact and email or mail contact. Okay, so that's number two. Number three to this is, and then I'm going to come back to the math here. Number three to this is I have to have permission. I need to get permission from the people to stay in touch with them once a month. So I'll give you, I'm going to give you how I say it. You don't have to say it exactly this way, but I'll give you basically the script that I use. And that is, I have a select group of people. So if you just kind of think of it that way is, I have a select group of people that I stay in touch with on a regular basis, and I'd like to add you to that list. I mean, it's not difficult, just I've got a select group of people that I stay in touch with. I keep them updated on the market, let them know what's going on in, 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 in their area or whatever. I would like to add you to that list. So okay. yes or no? Yep. I, I got to get permission to do that. Now. To do one or to do number two. So I have a select to do group these of things. people I stay in touch with. I have a select group of people that I stay in touch with on a regular basis. A lot of regular basis to keep them updated on the market. And like I say, you don't have to say it exactly, but the main thing I, why would I say I have a select group of people? Why would I use the word select? 
Because then it sounds special. Sounds special. I'm gonna, and, and in essence, based on what I'm telling you, is that true? Right. Yeah. Because I'm saying we got our SOI piece here, but this is going to be a select group within our SOI that we're going to give a, more attention to. Sean called them the A-list people. You're gonna, if you wanted to say it that way instead of even a select group, I've got an A-list group of people that I stay in touch with, that's fine too. You just want them to feel like what I'm going to add you to is special. Okay? Yes. Not everybody gets to do this. So I'm going to put you in this special group that I have. I've got a special group. That's another way you could say it. I've got a special group of people that I stay in touch with. So we've got to get permission. Now, there's two reasons we want permission. Number one, it allows us to then stay in contact with them. But number two, for you, the reason most agents don't follow up with their SOI is what? They don't want to be pushy. They don't I don't want them to feel like I'm bugging them. Yeah, I don't want to mess with the relationship. That's why permission. So if you've got a database right now of 700 people, pick 200 of them and call and see if you can get permission. Here's what I'll tell you. Almost every one of them, very few, will ever say no. Of, of the people that are in your database right now. If you just call them and said, look, I'm, I'm putting together a select group of people that will help me in growing my business. I'd like to add you to that list. What that means is I'm just going to be sending you an email once a month with market information, and then I'll contact you once a month as a business call just to say, is there anything I can help you with with real estate, or have you heard of anybody? It'll be a two-minute phone call. I promise not to bug you. In fact, as part of the permission, I would be saying to them, in fact, Linda, if you ever feel like it's bugging you, do you promise me you'll let me know? Yes. Awesome. Great. Now I have permission. Now once I have that, I could call and leave a voicemail. And I can say, hey, Linda, this is Russ. Just checking in. I sent you that email. Want to see if you had any real estate needs or if you've heard of anybody thinking of buying or selling. If you do, let me know. Like, this probably goes without saying, but the permission should be personal, right? Yes. It should be in person or on the phone. Yes. Not an email, not a text. Correct. Thank you. Yes. I would do it personal. Yeah. Now, the other thing, though, that I would say along the lines of that is this is where if you don't have, is anybody worried of like, I don't have 200 people in a database right now? Okay, good. That's fine. So instead, what you're doing is as you're prospecting, as you're making just listed, just sold calls, as you're out knocking on doors, whatever it is, what your whole objective, now this is where this gets a little counterintuitive, well, not too counterintuitive, but most people are out door knocking or calling expires for sale buyers, all that stuff, looking for only this. You're still going to do that. That is your primary objective. So when you're calling, my primary is I want an appointment, just the same as how you've been doing it. All we're adding to this is if I can't get an appointment, I'm going to take that extra couple of minutes to say, well, hey, you know, actually, Linda, it's been great talking to you. I've actually got a select group of people that I just stay in touch with on a regular basis, keep them updated on the market. I'd love to add you to that list. Would that be okay? Yes? Great. Yes. Let me get your email. Let me get your phone number. What it looks like, I'm going to send you an email. I'll just touch base with you once a month, see if you have any questions about real estate or if you've heard of anybody. Sound good? Absolutely. Yes. Great. Talk to you later. You don't get their home address? Yeah, I get their home address, but probably um, I know that probably if I'm... If yeah, you just for sale, expired, or just up. listed, just sold, but maybe not. But yeah, I would want their information. So now what I'm doing is I'm hitting two things at the same time. I'm still looking for the now business, but if I don't get it, then I go to this. Great, I'd like to add you to that list. Box, so now what I'm doing though, so let's say that you were over here at how many people would you say you got, Russ? Me? Yeah. Zero. Zero SOI. You don't know anybody. Oh well, I mean, your I'm wife. Well, your wife okay. could be number one. If we're looking at it from that perspective, uh, <laughs> 20, 30. Okay, so let's say you've got twenty or thirty. List. So what you want to do, especially for you, when you're prospecting, for sure, anybody that you can't get an appointment with, anybody, mm -hmm. doesn't matter. And even if they're not even that friendly, try to get them into this select group, because what what you're going to do. So at first, for you, you're just going to grow it to two hundred. So you're not going to get rid of anybody. You're just going to grow it. Till, once it hits 200, now it's closed in, in or fixed in size, and you're going to start getting rid of people. Does that make sense? You know, just a hint for him. He's a good talker, and he's very clear when he talks. Anybody that you talk to, start talking to them about that, for and sure. then start adding them and adding them and adding yeah. them. Hand them your business card. Same thing. You go out to lunch today. The person who takes your money, ask them. 
or they wait on try to yeah anybody try to find out can you get an, do they have any real estate needs if they do great get an appointment if not I've got a select group of people that I stay in touch with about real estate I'd love to add you to that list Is that okay yes get permission and you put them in there okay so then you start contacting now let, let me finish this off let me show you where this can be really powerful is so let's let's go back to our system now remember it's got to be fixed in size so it can't be 110 in this scenario where I mean it should be the 200 but we're using 100 so I got to get rid of 10 people out of here right because it has to stay fixed in size mm -hmm. which 10 should I get rid of the red. yeah I was gonna say this side or this side <laughs> Obvious, right? I need to get rid of 10 of these because I added 10 here and this is why it doesn't really matter what number I use other than it screwed me up by doing all of them is green. But so I got to get rid of 10. So I'm going to subtract 10 here. So now I have 45 here and 55 here still, right? Right. What just happened to my percentage now? I don't even have to have James calculate it for oh, me. It goes up. <clears throat> Look at what just happened. Well, you don't even have to. I would already right. did the math. Right. Yeah. Look at what just happened. The same amount of work as I was up here, I was at 50-50. Same amount of work now, a month later, I'm now at 55-45. What happens if I do it again? And then let's say this time that we... Um, How about if you shift what? to the people from the 45 into your 55? That would be great, except for that. Are you? Can I force somebody to go buy or sell a house? No, but I mean, if you're working with them and you're molding them into maybe. Well, so but let me back up for a sec. Remember, of this hundred, we really don't know who is who. Right. How do How do we know who's green? That this is probably actually a great question. How do I know who is in this case orange? How do I know who it is? How do right, I know? You'd who have to know that to subtract the ten. Correct. So, so how am I going to know who these are? I think over time, you know, if they're sending you a referral, if they're open to... If they send me a referral, you, what are they? Green. green. Yeah, so I, if well, somebody's green. sending me a referral, I'm not going to get rid of them, right? Mm -hmm. So let me, let's take the reverse side. How do I know who is red? They're not doing anything. They're not even answering your calls or email. See, it, it becomes very simple to figure this out because ultimately what I'm doing is is these people so think of it this way every time I contact them monthly in essence I'm rating this database of 1 to 200 200 being really good one one being horrible so every time I do it now here's what I'll tell you this is the other reason you need 200 to begin with is what's gonna happen is let's say you go to lunch today Russ you talk to the whoever takes your money and you say I got a select group of people I'd like to add you to and they say yes Okay, bam, you, you get all their information, you add it. A month from now, you call them up and you say, hey, Russ, this is Russ, and uh, I just was um, wanting to touch base with you. I told you last month that I would give you a call. If he has done nothing in a month with that person, even really maybe even tomorrow, what is the likelihood that they even know who he is well. on that person? Pretty low. Pretty low, right? So here's a side note. If somebody says yes, you have to kick them a mail. write them a thank you card like the next day of, hey, it was great meeting you. I just wanted to give you one of my business cards, uh, let you know I'll be in touch, you know, whatever. That first month, you probably shouldn't go just one month. Give them an email right away, send them a, a handwritten thank you note, something like that to get them in there, okay? So that when you call them. But you're going to have a few of those, though, that after maybe you call them on month, month one and they're like, Oh, that's right. Yes, I do remember. Yeah, I, I remember because that kind of caught me off guard. People don't usually do that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, things are good. No, I haven't heard of anybody thinking of buying or selling. The next month he calls and they go, who's this? It was Russ. Remember I met you a couple months ago and I just wanted to see if you got my mail. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. You know, actually, they're a tire kicker. I, well, or they just go, you know what? Actually, I'm really not that interested. I mean, early on, some of these people are going to turn. I mean, you make that phone call and you go, they go, you know what? I'm really not that interested. What yeah, okay. They're red, right? So yeah. now, that's what I'm saying. Now that I got to get rid of 10, it, it becomes very easy of who it is that I'm trying to get rid of, is because I'm trying to just reduce the reds. So 
this is where it's counterintuitive, and it's actually number four of your protocols, because you want to look for red. So when I'm calling my database, typically what people will do is they'll call their database trying to find the people who want to do a deal. That's not the purpose of my call. The purpose of my call is to figure out are they red? Because watch what happens. So let's say I go out and I'm prospecting again, and I have a really good month prospecting, okay? Let's say this time, what ends up happening is I get seven. So let's say I get 10 more leads. Oops. This not having a green is really screwing me. I get seven new leads, and seven of them turn out to be orange or green, and three end up being red. Okay, so now I'm at 48 here, 62 here, right? Mm -hmm. but, but I got to stick with my protocol of it's got to be fixed in size. I'm now at 110 <coughs> again. I got to get rid of 10. Which 10 am I going to get rid of? Red. Yeah, I'm getting rid of my mom because she hasn't sent me a referral ever in my whole real estate career. So I'm going to kick my mom out of this database, right? I mean, does it, I mean, it's whoever it is, right? It doesn't matter. My point being, like, you just got to figure out who's the worst one in here. So as you call through them, you might make a little note to yourself of, hey, if I need to get rid of somebody, this is the guy I'm getting rid of this next month. Put them on yellow. Yeah, that's right. You could call it yellow, uh, however you want to do it. And that's not a bad idea. Say, this, they're now yellow. And then you can go in and go, okay, next when I got to get rid of somebody, I'm choosing from the yellow, whatever it is. Okay? So I get rid of those now. Now look at what just happened. My percentage now, so I'm still at 62 here. I'm now at 62% of the people. Uh, this 62% is the people who either are doing something real estate related in the next year or will refer somebody to me. And I'm at 38% that way and I haven't increased my workload one bit. Do you see the magic uh, in this? Yes. I'm glad Linda does. Okay, so what am I getting like, all we're I'm doing is just shifting excited. through Way excited. It's like I can't sit but still. But, yeah. but, it's the, cool. but doesn't it just make sense, though, if you took a group of whatever size, but let's say 200, and you just threw anybody in there, but over time what you did is you slowly kicked out the people who were no good and kept the ones that were good, and then over more time kicked out some more that weren't good and had more that were good, what's going to happen? I mean, it's automatically getting better and better and better, right? That's the magic of the closed system. That's why treating it as a closed system and saying, I'm just looking at who's the worst one I've got in here and getting rid of them. And does it matter even who I replace them with? No. If you know they're bad, it doesn't even matter if you replace them with a bad one. Are you any worse off? No, no you're in the same boat. That's, that's the free throw. Like, I, that's, what, that's how I get a free throw out of it is I got rid of a bad one, and even if I put in one that was just as bad or worse, I'm no worse off. <laughs> but what happens, though, is oh, what are the chances over time, though, you're going to keep kicking people out that are, or excuse me, putting people in that are just as bad as the ones you're kicking out? Very unlikely, right? I just realized I never sent this thing around. I've but can you? Last few times. I got you last time. Uh -oh. Yeah, I forgot to send it around last time. I don't think time. I signed one. I keep writing you down then. It's because you stand up and leave. I I'm, just teasing. Angry. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. I get oh, angry. I get angry. That looks empty. I'm like, you got to go get an angry whopper. Huh? Okay, angry. so uh, you follow, can you see, go ahead, Russ. So just to kind of try and make sense of it in my mind, so you're still kind of using an open system when you're prospecting uh -huh. to dump leads into your closed system. Oh, and then over time, you're refining and you're getting rid of waste and you're putting in valuable resources and getting rid of waste. And, and over time, you're trying to solidify a high quality uh -huh. SOI. A, yeah, a so, solid base. Yeah, think of it this way. To begin with, the threshold, like the barrier to entry is so low. Like, if you breathe, you can come into this select group of people. But, but over time, what happens is it gets better and better to the point where, let me tell you, the, the, the person who does this the best is a gal by the name of Tonya Messina. Tonya Messina learned this in probably, God, I'll bet it's been 12 years ago probably now that she first started learning this. 
12 years ago when she learned this, she just said, I'm gonna do this exactly the way you're talking about, so she did. Is she here? No, she actually has her own company. Today, she has 97 people. So, Leah, do you know Tonya Messina? Um, we met. Oh, but you don't know her real well? Okay, uh -huh. I, just, I was just gonna let you validate what I was saying. But, but so she, her select group of people, she has 97 people that she has in this select group that she stays in touch with. From that, she's generating over $300,000 in agent commission from those 97 people and that's the only prospecting she does is these 97 people because she started it she did all this stuff we're talking about started it as kind of this open system so to speak but then has matured it over time and has just slowly so think of it this way for you Russ right now with saying I got 20 people if they breathe you'll put them into your select group of people for you to get into Tonya's group now this select group you pretty much have to do a deal with her in order to get into that group. So it's almost like she's got 97 loaded dice. That's right. In there. That's exactly like the way right I'm now saying. I've got 20 really lame dice. Mm -hmm. And so you're just constantly prospecting some high probability people. That's know? right. And so if you load a fixed box with high probability people, then your percentages go yeah. up. Yeah. She has gone and found 97 people who will be her advocate. That will, that will anytime they hear somebody say anything about real estate, that they'll go, Stephanie, you got to call, don't you? because she is just so awesome. I mean, imagine that. Imagine if you had 97 people that were out, every time they heard the word real estate, they said, you gotta call Linda. What would happen to your business? Her reputation's good, that's why they do that. Well, so yeah, there's no question, you gotta give a high customer service, you gotta take good care of the people, because if you don't, they're not gonna do that, right? Yeah. But, but that's where the magic in this, because the threshold starts really low, but the more you just keep following the system of, of get rid of the ones that are bad, the better this site gets. Is there a way to, I mean, it's not like I want this. I know it's not gonna happen overnight. Yeah. But obviously, we know this is a numbers game. So is there a way that you can do more prospect or more contacts a day to ramp it up, to sooner. Ramp it up sooner? So or great is question. Or more organic, this side of it? No, um, the answer is yes to that. And, and here's what I would say, here's the difference. The difference to getting it to happen quicker, mm -hmm. the answer to that is who you drop in, if you think of this funnel up here, okay. it's who you're prospecting. Yeah. Meaning, if you were to go, if you, if you add people who are hand raisers, that's probably the way to say it. What you wanna do is the people, to have it happen quicker for you, you wanna add hand raisers. What's a hand raiser? They're well, ready they to be buy. involved in real estate. They want it. And, and so how do you know that? By asking buyers questions. So a for sale by owner and expired would be awesome to, so again, the secret to it is back you to, don't add let's them, say. You just prospect it if you kick it off. Well, but, but let's, let's talk about an expired. Let's say you call an expired who says, you know what? We actually are so frustrated with the whole process. We're just gonna wait a couple of months to, to put our home on the market. If you took one of them and added them into this, and you're staying in touch, <coughs> providing something of value to them, staying in touch, what are the chances down the road when they list, you're gonna be the one that they talk to? Very likely. Well, let me ask it this way. How many agents will, any of the expireds that you called today, how many agents are still calling them two months from now? Two. Yep. Yeah, very few, um, right? Oh, okay, sorry, very few. Sorry, in my row, they all do. That's why I'm like, and yes. Two months later, they still are. Uh huh. To Timbra, and she, okay. Mike. But are, it's fascinating. Are you this? But those are the only two that Sean was talking about. Then. Are you recording <laughs> this? Yes. Oh, okay. Because yeah. I didn't want to say because the guy that I interviewed with in St. George does that. He calls back every two weeks or once well, a month. Oh, you can say his name. It's okay. He oh yeah, care. he probably already knows, but. He does that. I was watching. You're him. talking about Brian Burnett. Yeah. Right? And how and many deals does Brian Burnett do this last year? Well, he, about 120. Know. Brian? <laughs> yeah. Well, he's not going to care. I, I, I have told him. I'll be in St. George actually next Wednesday, and I've told him. I talk about you in class. So, but so let me throw that. So yeah, yeah. If you want it to happen quicker, the people you put in just need to be hand raisers. So think of it just this connect. way too. Of somebody who calls off of a listing is a hand raiser. 
if you can't get them to do a deal now, if they're not ready right now for whatever reason, you go, great, I've got a select group of people. What I'm going to do is I'll just stay in touch with you. I mean, you're going to call your database anyway, right? Yeah. I mean, that's everybody would agree that's like first like call. Should be. Camera. Anyone else feels this crazy? <laughs> Sometimes it's not. It's because you're on the front row. Sean's on the back. He's still not good. Sometimes it's not even asking them to be on your contact list Sometimes, and because maybe they already are. Sometimes it's just, hey, how's everything going? I remember when your kid. Got well, on that for program sure. At school. Yeah, no, that's you what know, you're doing with this. Going. Yeah, yeah, that's what this is. But small talk. But this. So that when you say, "How do I get it quicker?" I mean, anybody that is a hand raiser, somebody that calls off of a on a listing of yours, and and you, your objective is, I got to get an appointment with them, and if I can't, if they won't give you an appointment, so you've asked three or four or five times, and they've said no, great. Well, I've got a select group of people that I stay in touch with. I'd like to add you to that list. Now. My part of my prospecting just becomes calling these people. So if you had 200 people and you got to call them once a month, let's just hypothetically for ease of numbers say you're only going to call 20 days out of the 31, or in this case 28 this month. And you're going to divide them up per day. So how many per day are you going to call if you're calling 20 days out of the month? How many do this you want? 10, days. right? Yeah, how many do you want So to do? part of your 10 contacts every day are just going to be these people. But these are the people who are going to mature over time Be your and blow up. So that's why I say if you want it to happen quicker, yes, it can. Phil, in fact, I had actually an agent, and you probably won't like this, but I'll tell it to you anyway. I had an agent who came to me one day. I'm trying to think if he's actually even might be here. This was at a different company. No, it wasn't. He's, he's not here. He came to me and said, light bulb just went on for me. If he said, I'm going to go and do um, open houses every weekend, and the people who show up to the open house, I'm going to fill up my group of these people with the people who walk into an open house. Why would that be a good, why would those people be hand raising? They're all raising their hands. They're all hand raisers. Yeah. Of their good, they're here's what we know. We actually door. track this. Now, here's the challenge with it. You'll hear Mike Ferry say, Open houses are a waste of time. You're going to yeah. hear George say it. You're going to hear John say it. I, for the seller, they're a waste of time. And the way, that, the way that most agents do them, they're a waste of time. If you do it right, you can actually capture a bunch of people that you put in here that you stay in touch with. We actually did a study. The people who show... So here's the problem. Why, why they're a waste of time is you because you might get nobody. Well, but even with the neighbors, here's what... I, we actually did a study on this where we tracked the people for a year, 82% of the people who walk in to an open house will do a real estate deal within 12 months. Holy oh, yeah. So if you, but the key is you gotta stay in touch with them. So, right. now, and the downside, to why they say they're a waste of time and why I would agree is because of number one, how agents do it. Number two is they do them in a bad area. If you went and did one in Sugar House, have you ever done an open house in Sugar House? How many people came through? 32 hours. In two hours, 30 people. Does that sound, that, that's a waste of time. Just, now imagine, too many people that are, imagine if, if you got eight out of the 10 of those, so 24 out of the 30, and you added them to something like this and you stayed in touch with them over a two or three months. So part of, here's why I was a little hesitant. Part of it is on why this takes some time, why nothing happens here. Remember I said 82% of those people will do something in a, in a you really, the number is six to nine months. The reason this takes that long is you fill it up with those people. They're just not ready yet. Right. But the truth is, if you filled it up with only hand raisers, so only for sale by owners, only expireds, only um, people at an open house, people who called in off of a sign, an internet lead, those type of things, if you filled it up with that, it'll pop a little bit sooner. So that was a long way to answer your question. Yes. Yeah. So how? what is a successful open house? How do you... That's a whole two hours I could spend with you. I'll give you the short answer. Okay. I'll give you the short answer. You go out and door knock the entire neighborhood and you talk to talk to at least a hundred people. To really? Invite. And wow. invite them to your open okay. house that day that you're gonna hold it. No, no, you do it the week or even two weeks leading I've done up to open houses and they're just depressing. So yeah. I'm like, well, I'm here, let me tell you why. It, let me show you why. You want me to show you why? Yeah. Because you didn't do any door knocking around them. Right. You put out two or three signs. Yes. You sat there for two or three hours. Yes. And when the people walked in, you said, 
Take a look around. If you have any questions, let me know. Yes. That's why it didn't work. Exactly. You just landed on it. I didn't. No one ever told. No one so told in, me I had to open well, out. Well, I know you well, chose the wrong wanna, company. I didn't want to tell my career. Not, not I didn't really. want to tell my coach <laughs> that I was doing an open house. Because yeah, don't. They'll, they'll, everyone was like, they'll be like, it's a waste of time. Don't do an open house. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna do it. Open yeah. House. No, if what you do instead is you go door knock and talk to a hundred people in the neighborhood uh -huh. and tell them, we're gonna be doing an open house for your neighbor, the Johnsons, and. I just wanted to give you an invitation and find out who do you know that wants to move into the area and they'll say nobody. Now here's the other thing actually that I would do as well and we will talk about this, I don't remember what class, maybe I usually do it this one and I just didn't. Well that's okay. Go so ahead, what leave, are you going leave. To? I'm just teasing. Um, I don't know, I gotta remember. But here's the other thing, find all the for sale by owners that are right around the open house. I imagine this, picture this for a second. Daryl's an open house. You're an, you are, excuse me, you're a for sale by owner, okay? So Daryl's a for sale by owner, okay, Linda? I knock on his door. Hey, Daryl, uh, my name is Russ. I'm with Century 21 Everest. What's he immediately thinking? He's gonna, he wants to sell his house. house. And I, I'm not here today to talk to you about, huh? 50 people from your company yeah. already called I, me. I know, right? You kick a bush and they run out, right? Mm -hmm. and throw in Rick's thing. So, um, I'm not here actually to talk to you about trying to sell your house. Actually, what I'm here to talk to you about is we're going to be doing an open house for your neighbor, the Johnsons down here. Do you, have you met the Johnsons? No. Yeah, sure. You you have met them? Okay. Well, so you know that we've got their home listed for sale, right? Well, I'm going to be doing an open house for them on Saturday. And the reason I'm here to talk to you is because we're planning on having a lot of traffic there. and. What I, one of the things I know is typically the people who come into an open house aren't going to probably necessarily want to buy their house, but I would love to talk to them about your house and maybe even bring them down, but I guess I just wanted to find out. If I did that, are you willing to pay a buyer agent commission? So you got the front end and the back end on this. So would you be willing to different, yes. Yeah, you would be? different conversation. Okay, so but would you be willing to pay me yes, a, okay, you would, okay, great. So what I'd like to do is schedule a time to come back and take a look at your house so that I'm familiar with it, so that when people show up to the open house, I'd be able to talk to them about your house. Is that okay? That'd be when would be a good time we could come and do that? Now, I schedule a time, I come back, I go look at it. Now, they'll also go, why don't you come in right now? If you want to do it right then, great. Typically for the women, I usually recommend saying, um, no, I want to come back another time or whatever, you know, and, and then you could bring whatever. But um, just You're out not of safety. Concerned about our safety? No, I don't care about you guys. I just want to protect the females. And, you know. Wait, so you say you knock and you just say, "Hey, we just want to invite you over to the open house today or tomorrow at the Johnsons." Well, for most of the neighbors, but for the open house, I'm going to do it as a. Um, oh, I for, I think that's why Leah was here. I think it was supposed to get done early. We better wrap it up. Okay. okay. But anyway, it's just quick. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to use the open house as a way with him to get to know him as the for sale buyer. I'm approaching him in a totally different manner than everybody else is. Right. What, he's actually seeing me work. Yeah. And so then, uh, what do you think he's going to do on the day of the open house? He's going to come. Talk he's going to do an open house. No, he'll do an open house because he's going to try to capture people that I I'm bringing in with my signs. Yeah. So he's going to do an open house. Then I'm going to go back and say, how'd your open house go? Because I had 10 people. You had how many? Two. Two? Oh, wow. God, that's crazy. I mean, he's seeing that I'm better at it than him. So anyway, we can finish talking that's about That's about as good of information as you have. All right. Thanks, guys. Sorry, Leah. I totally forgot that's when you okay. walked in. You should have said, remember, you got to get done early. That's okay. We'll <laughs> make it work I just, just as fine. soon as I saw Shay, I was like, oh, oh yeah. Uh-huh. Forgot. Can I just kind of stack these things because I got to put some lasagna in? Yep, out. I'm going to pull it off of there.